I'm here today with Pete Rushmere from Flagship Partners. Hello, Pete. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about how you can make sure that your team are safe when they work from home. So lots of us have got team members that are having to work from home because of the COVID crisis, and we need to make sure that they are safe in the work that they are doing for you. As always, if you like this video, please click the little like button. If you have any questions whatsoever, please post them in the comments below this video, and Pete and myself will make sure that you get an answer. And also remember to subscribe to the channel so you get notified when I upload Upload other videos that can help you improve the running of your practice. Let's get started. Oh, hello again. Uh, my clock has just turned 12.30 and we have Pete Rushmere along today in order to talk about how your team should be working at home and the things that you should be doing in order to make sure that your team are safe working from home and the conversation originated on the basis that hello Pete uh, originated on the basis that back in March um, when we were all shut down for the first time lots of us sent team members home uh, laptops and computers and monitors and whatnot under their arms uh, to work from home and then in the summer they've come back and now we've been sent home again and it's looking like it's going to be a six month uh, challenge and I think uh, as a community we need to make sure that we're looking after our customers sorry looking after our team members as we should and hence the invitation to Pete. Uh, good afternoon Jeff and Jeff has just used the chat box so as I always say at the beginning of these conversations it's the questions that you ask as we go through the presentation as we go through the conversation that help make these conversations and meetings as useful as they are so if there's a question that comes up as Pete is talking please feel free to pop them in the chat box or better still for me pop them in the Q&A box so if you look at the right hand side of your screen at the bottom you'll see two little bubbles and a Q and an A if you pop them in there it just makes it easier for me to manage so please feel free to ask any questions that you've got as we go through and we've also obviously got the preloaded questions that you shared as you registered so that's enough from me I know you're not here to hear me this morning you're here to uh, get some wisdom from Pete so without further ado let me hand you over with a virtual round of applause welcome Pete Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. I really, really appreciate it. And good afternoon to everyone on the call as well. Um, let me just share my screen uh, with you guys. Hopefully you guys can see that now. So thank you everyone for taking time out on your uh, lunch schedule to have a listen to me talk about working from home and how you can look to create a safe environment and support your team members in, in a safe environment in the workplace whether when, when they're at home and um, it, my background is uh, my business is flagship partners and we help companies with uh, compliance health and safety HR and training as well we've got a suite of solutions and I'll talk to you a bit more about those later on uh, so myself uh what I'm interested to hear from you guys is in the chat box or, or in the Q&A box, as, as Simon quite rightly pointed out, um, would you be able to let me know on a scale of one to 10, how confident you are with your team working from home, please? Um, it'd be interested to hear sort of where you guys are at with that. Um, if you can just put that uh, number, so one being poor and 10 being absolutely excellent uh if you'd be able to put that in and then maybe why uh why you feel that is uh, and that would be really useful for me because i can go and have a look at those answers um obviously we've got quite a few questions to have a work through in this session and i'm going to be sharing that information with you so uh let me just have a look we have got some coming in here so to be fair we look like we've got quite a bit of confidence uh confidence in the room um we've got a seven sixes nines and eights so that's uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've got got another six there, so that's really good. So hopefully you guys will be able to help me um, help me with a few things. Ten, brilliant. Okay, excellent. Well, hopefully hopefully I'll still be able to bring you some value. It, it seems like you're sort of well on the way already. Um, obviously, some of you may have been working from home before COVID hit, but when when COVID did hit, it was a case of essentially upping tools and heading home, and um, there was no real need for uh, the HSE expectation was quite low on what would be in place uh, for companies. 
when that occurred because it was just a case of moving people and, and taking them back and over the last six months people have found ways of working um to to accommodate that but you do hear some horror stories about how people are set up at home so i thought we'd take it back to basics and let's have a talk through sort of what what you guys will need to have in place to support your team members so your two biggest people risks with people working from home are one the risk around people's mental health and the second around having a poor work environment. So if we focus first on sort of the, the mental health situation, um, there, there's a really high possibility where people are at home working on their own, um, that they're going to feel isolated, potentially abandoned, uh, very lonely and, and, and also unsupervised as well. And I know myself from being a subcontractor to uh, or I look after consultation work with, with clients. And in March, when I first started working from home and I was actually out of those businesses, there, there's a business that I visit on a weekly basis. And I didn't know the challenges they were facing financially at the time. So I actually felt really uh, challenged by the fact that I felt that my role as their consultant uh, in, the, in the manner that I supported them was potentially at risk. So, and, and when that added to the other anxieties I had around us being sent home in March and all the other challenges with COVID as well, um, I know that I felt really worried. And whenever I picked the phone up to ring those, uh, w- when I rang the company owners, and I shan't say who they are because it's unfair, but when I picked the phone up to ring them um, and they didn't answer, I'd be like, you know, I'd, I'd fear the worst. So, and I felt very much abandoned there. So it's something really worth bearing in mind is that whilst you perceive there's a level of safety for your team, do they feel that way too? And are you communicating that well enough with them? So that's a really, really important factor for having a great work in ho- a work from home uh, agreement with your team. So, and we'll elaborate that a little bit more later on. And then the second area is around having a really fantastic work environment for them. So um, obviously you can't affect too much of that. So we're going to talk about that in a bit more depth and how or the different policies that you need in place or risk assessments to be able to support people in their home environment to ensure that they've got the equipment they've need and that you've met the expectations on you as an employer um, if, uh, if, you know, to ensure that people are well supported. So five steps to effective working from home. Now, um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is actually the agility that this gives us as businesses to actually be able to gear us up to work from home as well. And at the moment, I I feel in a good position to be able to talk about it because I'm in a position where we're building our own team of people um, who are working from home and I'm going through those cultural challenges and I've seen it as well from uh, an outsider looking in on an organisation of around 50 or 60 where people are are sort of now working remotely. And uh, I'll talk about that in a bit more depth in a moment too. So the first step of the five steps to effective working from home is around setting clear expectations, which is uh, notified in that in, in the slide here by the clipboard with the pen. Now, um, clear expectations is is hugely, hugely important as part of your organisation and as your business with the people that are working from home. Because just the other day, I was reading an article in The Guardian around, um, excuse me one second, um, people in The Guardian, um, there's an article around people uh, suffering from burnout and that people were really struggling because there was so much expectation on them to just carry on working and even though there was you know there was no expectation around when to stop and they 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 didn't feel like they'd done enough work because they'd not been into the workplace so um that's really really important and um, it may be worth considering alternative working agreements because rather than having a set period of time from say nine to five it may be more beneficial to actually set objectives for people and outcomes that you expect from them so that's certainly something that i've explored employing uh, the new people in my business as they've been coming in and working from home i've looked a lot less around the time period they're working but actually a lot more being outcome focused with them so uh, that's certainly uh, very important and then the second area which is highlighted there by the computer uh, screen and and the computer itself is you'll hear me talk about DSE um, and the DSE risk assessment now what I mean by that is the D stands for display the S stands for screen and the E stands for equipment. So apologies if I'm teaching anyone to suck eggs there, but the DSE is a display screen equipment or essentially computer and monitor. Now, 
the expectation now is that where we have more than five employees, we'll have a documented risk assessment in place. Now, as employers, it's not necessarily your responsibility to go to your workers' workplace to do that. And uh, it's something that they can do themselves. Um, you can provide them training. We've got an online course on uh, display DSE awareness or display screen equipment awareness. And they're able to just train them, have a quick session on that so they understand how things should be set up ergonomically for them. And then they're going to be able to carry out their own risk assessment off the back of that. Uh, the third area is around your systems. So those three dots and, and the hierarchy there was just around sort of considering those, those systems, GDPR. Um, I recently did um, a podcast uh, for my podcast, A Half Dozen Things. And we spoke about the GDPR compliance from home and obviously how much of an increased risk there is now from data, your, your customer data being, being taken. And obviously in the profession that you guys are in, that, that needs to really be uh, locked down. So I'm sure you've probably got everything in place for that. But if you haven't, it's, it's worth considering um, and, uh, and, and going from there. Uh, and I'm sure Simon's got great people you could speak to to support you with that as well. Um, the fourth area was around having necessary and relevant training. Now, it's really, really important that because you've got a team of people at home, you don't necessarily know what challenges they're facing or what they're struggling with. And in a normal workplace where you're surrounded by peers, uh, you've got the opportunity to ask questions and uh, it feels like much less of a, of a big deal for people when they're working to be able to just go and tap on someone's shoulders and go, can you give me some help with this? Whereas now in a situation where someone's at home, that it feels like a much bigger task to pick up the phone and actually admit that you may be challenging with, challenged with something or by something. So uh, now more than ever, I would argue that it's a fantastic opportunity as part of your ongoing one-to-ones with your team uh, to look at having a personal development plan to ensure that people have got the right support and the right knowledge in the role that they're doing and in the tasks that they're doing, that they're stretched and engaged in the work they're doing, but also that they're not getting overstretched. And uh, uh, that's that's hugely important. And I didn't realise personally, I've had some feedback that I was overstretching one of my team um, and uh, and they were feeling you know they were feeling a little bit isolated and and like they were having a challenge, and then the fifth area uh, there is around having a supportive culture. So really really important part of your working environment and all that goodwill that you may have created in your offices or in your workplaces is is null and void by the time people have gone home now. Um, and that's something I've certainly witnessed. I'm part of a large organisation where uh, we meet on a weekly basis in person. Um, there's 50 to 60 people in that group. And we've taken that meeting online and all of that goodwill, all of that know-how of how to run a fantastic meeting, for example, has literally disappeared overnight. Um, people are feeling disengaged. Uh, they're not feeling like they're getting that human interaction. So something to reflect on today would be around how, how best to transform that culture that you've built in your workplaces with your team of people and how best to implement that with people when they're at home uh, as well. So, um, yeah, they're, they're sort of the five key areas that I think are worth really considering for, for people as we move on uh, to the, the questions and answers. But it's certainly really important that we focus on supporting people's mental health. And I'll talk a bit more about how we can do that as well as we work through the questions. So um, I'm not sure if Simon's going to unmute himself and start asking me some of these preloaded questions. Yeah, um, has that been helpful here, so because... far, Simon? Adam? Has that been helpful so far, Simon? Very much so. So just, just refreshes. what do the four five icons stand for, Pete? Just go over yeah, them again. Sure. So um, clear expectations. Yeah. Uh, DSE risk assessment. Yeah. The third one is around having great systems that will be able to work from home. Yeah. Uh, the fourth one is around, and, and, and that's, the systems is also about the frustration. I didn't really talk about that, the frustration that people have at home. Uh, the fourth one is around having necessary and relevant training. And and the fifth area is around a supportive culture. Culture, brilliant. And the, and the one that most people on the call will be familiar with, I think, is the DSC assessment. Yeah. So just talk to us. I know we've got lots of questions that we're going to go over, but just talk to me about what a display screen assessment is um, and how people undertake them and what things it covers. Can you please? Yeah, absolutely. So a display screen uh, equipment risk assessment is ensuring that uh, someone is appropriately sat at the desk so um, they've got the right equipment so they're able to see effectively that they're sitting with the right posture that we're we're ensuring they've got the equipment to mitigate the risk of any um, 
long-term injuries from from sitting at the desk and working so and, and what sort of things would that cover pete so for example i know one of the things that comes up on ours is that they have to have a separate screen to yeah. keyboard so i know uh, one or two people post posted that they've got laptops that people are using yeah um how, how does that work yeah so with the what i would say with the my guidance with the with the dse um uh, equipment uh, risk assessment is that you you would task your team to do it themselves because some people will be happy to work from a laptop in, in which case that's absolutely fine but in um in, in reality, you ought to. There's a, it, it's important to have a separate monitor that's easily visible and actually a separate keyboard as well. So it's not ideal to work from a laptop long term. Um, and uh, if that comes up as part of the risk assessment that someone's dissatisfied with that working environment, then uh, as a business, we'd, we'd need to make adjustments or reasonable adjustments to support them with that. Um, now, some people will be working from home and they may have a lack of space. Uh, to be able to to do that, so um, yeah, it's uh, essentially a case of they need to do their own assessment. And in some cases, it may be that it's not appropriate for people to be working from home if they haven't got the equipment they need and the space they need to be able to do so. And and at that point, they should be back in the office using the equipment that's in the office in order absolutely. for them to be safe, basically. Uh, uh, and that's absolutely right. So if, if they're working from home at the moment, Pete, do they have, do we as an employer have a requirement to give them that stuff? So say, for example, uh, I don't know, let's, let's call her Anne, uh, works for us. Uh, she doesn't feel safe coming into the office because of COVID and all the other different things. Perhaps she's self-isolating or she's uh, on the vulnerable list. So she's, she's choosing to work from home because she doesn't feel safe coming into the office. Are we obligated to give her equipment? Are we obligated to make sure that she's got a computer with an adjustable screen and a five spoke chair and all that sort of stuff? Or can we just say, no, basically, sodja uh, you're the one that's choosing to work from home you've got a perfectly good workstation and i know that some of this is a le- legal aspect of it but if, if she's working from home i suppose the question is if she's working at home do we have an obligation to pay for her equipment in order for her to be safe yeah absolutely where possible i'd say if she's working from home for an extended period it may be worth just transporting that equipment she has in the office to the place at home to to prevent having the expense of purchasing it twice um but uh yeah she would need that to work effectively from home if she needs it in the office too and it's so, that, that, so that's really the case. brilliant and i, I, I accept it's all a risk-based analysis there's no there's no yeah. right and wrong and if you do this you're going to be sent to the tower of london and all that sort of stuff it's all risk-based and how much as an employer you are prepared to accept yeah. from a risk point of view but in that situation if we believe she's going to be at home long term we should be doing as much as we can exactly the same as what we would be doing in the office equip- equipment wise yeah a- a- absolutely essentially that that place of work has transferred from all, all the obligations you'd have in a normal workplace have then essentially moved to to home for you to support her with having the right equipment um in 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 her home working okay. environment is that Thank okay you. now i've got i've got a question coming from katie and I, I think this might be a legal question as opposed to a health and safety question, but okay. um, I'll, I'll ask it, and I've got I've got an opinion on it as well. Uh, oh, okay. So if you, if you don't know, <laughs> Pete, then I'll 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 dive in. Uh, but Katie's asked, where do we as employers stand if someone doesn't have an appropriate work environment at home? For example, if they're working from their bed, but they say they don't feel safe to come into work in the office, can we insist they come in? That is, uh, that's a very tricky question. And my advice, non-legally, uh, would be to try and work with that person to come to a mutually beneficial agreement. Um, and uh, it feels a little bit like you've been given, a, if that's the situation, you've been given an ultimatum, which, which neither option is uh, a fair and reasonable one. Because, um, yeah, essentially, if you can get them into the office and they can work in a safe environment at that at that point um, but at the same time you can't force people who feel vulnerable into the workplace either and that that's kind of the situation the government have given us so uh, we need to find a way to get those people to work safely from home but it's not ideal for someone to be working from a bed either so what was your take on that Simon? Well m- my take is we, we had an employment barrister on about two months ago he also appeared on the Jeremy Vine show and on that show he said that as long as you've taken all reasonable steps to make that person safe 
if they then refuse to come into the office, you then don't have to pay them. So if they say, I don't feel safe coming into the office and you believe that you've made the office safe, then they basically you say, okay, well, you're, you're not uh, appearing for work and therefore I'm not going to pay you for doing it. Now, obviously the consequences of that at that point is that team member could then turn around and go, well, mental health, stress, unfair dismissal, constructive dismissal and all the other stuff that comes out of that. And it's potentially opening up a, a, a can of worms, but... Uh, as I say, that was a couple of months ago, Katie, now when we had Daniel on. And I know Daniel was quite, um, from a law perspective, very, uh, what should I say, certain in how you can deal with that. But then the consequences of that conversation and where that goes, um, he yeah. was a little less uh, a little less confident. In. So and, that and, and, is, God, sorry, Pete. Sorry, Simon. And that, that is absolutely the challenge is, that is the ongoing impact on your business as to the consequences of taking a hard line approach. Um, so... It's certainly on a case, but 95% of the cases are going to be really quite straightforward. And it, and it's just those odd ones, which are going to be a bit of a challenge. And certainly I would personally seek some support from, uh, uh, you know, an appropriate HR person um, and potentially from an employment solicitor as well. Um, if, you, if you've got one of those situations, which is a bit tricky um, and certainly, you know, we, we, we can help with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't feel I don't feel well enough to really sort of take a hard line approach on that. I'm afraid, Simon. Thank you. So let's go. Let's have a look at some of the, the questions that we've got in. So, uh, does it matter how many employees you have, or are the rules related to all size employer? So, does it make any difference how big you are, how many people you employ? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, um, the the HSC are a little bit grey up until you get to five people, essentially. So. Um, up until five people, a lot of this documentation, risk assessments, etc., are able to be in your head. Um, they don't need to be uh, properly documented. So uh, five is sort of the key number at which point you need to ensure that you've got uh, essentially potentially a work from home policy in place and, and, and the risk assessments. And you need to have those documented up until five. Um, it's good practice it's good practice to have that in place and, and protect yourselves. And, and I'd suggest that is the case, but it's not, uh, it's not a requirement. Thank you. And what, what sort of things I've heard you mention this working from home policy a couple of times now, what sort of things are included in that? Yeah. So a working from home policy would talk about, um, it, it'd have sort of clear outline of what the employer's, um, expectations and obligations are and then what the employees expectations and obligations would be as part of that agreement so it'd be it'd include working time it'd include having regular breaks from their screen um if they're provided with equipment that they use it so it's sort of sharing that responsibility between the employer and the employee so that that policy could include something along the lines of we, we expect you to work normal office hours because i know some members in the community have got team at home and, and there's all sorts of stuff going on, obviously kids and all the rest of it, and they're working odd hours. So they're getting up first thing in the morning or they're working late night. So you could have within the policy a description of basically of, of accepted of extended, accepted standards, even down, I suppose, to dress code on Zoom calls and things like that. Could you? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. So, and, and, and we're sort of crossing over the barrier into sort of the HR role, but essentially that we, we are starting to talk about that now because essentially whilst people are working more permanently from home, that contract might need a slight amendment as to the expectations on staff um, and on team members. So uh, yeah, absolutely. That could be appropriate is to start talking about how people appear on on Zoom calls um, and and what we expect from them as well. Thank you. Um, So what are my legal duties as an employer during this time? So our legal duties as an employer are uh, around making sure that people, they're they're very similar to normal, but essentially that work environment where you, uh, you're, you as people would have been based in your businesses in the office. Essentially it's about moving people to, to the home environment and ensuring they've got the right equipment um, and the right knowledge to be able to work safely in that way. Um, but also that we're looking after the, the health of our people as well. So um, ensuring that people are getting regular rest, um, that they're not burning out and making sure that we're looking after them from a mental health point of view as well. So it's, it's effectively everything that we've got, in the office we are also got responsibility for so is that too strong a word to make sure that they're being looked after at home as well that's the, the crux of it yeah thank you um will uh, continue working from home harm mental health um, and what's the most important factors to consider so do we uh, and just 
I'll ask a subsequent question on top of that. Are we responsible for doing like mental health assessments? I know Mind, um, the, the mental health charity, have got stuff that you can do for work. Are we, should we be doing things like that in order to assess people's mental health or help them be aware of their mental health while they're at home? Yeah, got you. So, um, th- sorry, there was a couple of questions there. but Yeah, sorry, the first one is, uh, continue working from home, harm mental health, and yeah. what's the important health factors to consider? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, working from home long term, will it affect mental health? It will affect different people differently. And, th- and I know that sounds really broad, but it's absolutely true. Um, some people will work from home really effectively, really well. It will totally suit their lifestyle, and they're going to be re- more than happy um, working from home. Uh, there's going to be other people that it's going to have a really negative impact on. And um, as, as you sort of think about the people in your team, those will become more apparent. Um, so now more than ever, it's very important that we start to consider the impact of those mental health challenges on, on our team members and particularly who is going to be more affected than, than others. Um, and it's, it's just ensuring that we have a regular form of communication with them and regular management of, of our team members. Um, how, do we have regular one-to-ones? Do we set expectations regularly? Um, are goals being met? Are we giving reg- regular feedback and having a good good level of c- communication? Because um, that is uh, absolutely, it's absolutely vital, essentially, uh, when we're looking after people's mental health. Have I sort of explained that clearly? You enough? have. There was a point in there, and I, I think, again, I, I know what you're going to say, Pete, but there's, there's a point where you say it's assessed regularly. So how, how regular is regularly? Hourly, daily, weekly, right, monthly? Of <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, you know, it depends on the role, but I would, I would expect of businesses of your type that um, you would look at sort of monthly one-to-ones with your team members in the office. So you might see them in transient between, between that point, you wouldn't just speak to them on a monthly basis. Um, But I, what, how I've implemented it with my team is that I have a Monday morning weekly zoom call uh, with, with all the team. And we talk about what happened the week before and what's coming up this week. So we've got interaction there, but I do regularly make sure that I feed back on performance and goals and uh, expectations on a monthly basis. Um, and, and that's sort of set vitally important in, in the calendar and doesn't get moved um, because that's, uh, that's unfair on the team member. And, and, and as you're doing that assessment or as, as you're having those conversations, you're, can't, you're doing that assessment informally and mentally registering whether somebody needs to have a, a perhaps a, a more personal conversation. Is that how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So it will be to gauge, gauge that, that situation. And, and, you know, we, we document those conversations that we do have. Um, there are from, from a specific mental health point of view, um, regardless of whether people are working from home or working in the office. Um, if, if, uh, people as part of this group want access to it, we, we have what's called a wellness action plan. So as your team grows, uh, it's a really useful document for line managers to proactively support people with their mental health. Um, we offer flagship offer mental health in the workplace training where we talk about um, stressors in the workplace and um, how we um, support people and how we put proactive mental health policies in place to support people and we regularly communicate that and work on culture and um, the uh, the wellness action plan is something that's really proactive so people will as part of their one-to-one will fill out initially a wellness action plan and you it sort of sets out sort of um, what they how what sort of support they would like as a member of staff and as a line manager how you can support them and what things that may occur that may cause them stress and what what worries them and that can be like a live document that sort of forms part of the one-to-one as well and that's really useful thing as an ongoing basis to support people thank you um and then i know you've touched on the fact that you can provide the policies i know we're going to share some contact details in a little while but what one of the questions is how, how much will all these changes cost so yeah. how, much, how much is a, a, a DSC one, assessment? <laughs> one million pounds. No, um, <laughs> I, I joke. So um, we've got an online course, a DSE awareness course, uh, which uh, team members can take. It's £35. Um, and uh, people can take that and then they can do their own risk assessment. So we're, we've got an offer on where we're offering the the, the shell document, the, the template document for the DSE risk assessment very very straightforward um and and we can provide that to people um you know 
is the is the awareness course mandatory no you know i'm not going to that's not forced on anyone but um there's also risk assessment online course so it depends on how deep you want to go go into uh the the training of your team um however you know I, i'm more than happy to share that that template document it's really quite a straightforward thing around people just confirming that they're quite happy with what they've got in their workplace at home uh to be able to support them with the work that they've got to do Okay, so what the the thirty five pound document is that thirty five pound per it, person, or is that just that's a a company wide thirty five quid? S- sorry, just to be clear, the 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 cost was for a course, so that that's a okay. proper it's a CPD accredited DSE awareness course, um, which uh, I know many larger employers will will insist that people do them on a regular basis every couple of years. Um, they are there, they are available. Um, you know, we, we can provide that if that's something that people want, if they don't feel comfortable that people will be able to carry out that risk assessment efficiently on their own or effectively on their own. Yeah, just to get clarity on that, Pete, is that £35 per employee or is that £35 per organisation? £35 per employee. Sorry. Per employee. So basically they, they pay the 35 quid or I pay the 35 quid as the employer. They go through the uh, training and then they assess themselves. That's right. Uh, and then off the back of that, the recommendations with regards to implementation and the like um, yeah, you, come through. Yeah, you, you then review those documents, those risk assessments. But essentially you, the benefit of it is you're putting the onus back on your team member. Um, it's up to them to essentially tell you if, if there's a shortfall um, and then you can address that. Thank you. Um, and we'll share those contact details in a minute. I think Mark, who's uh, also in the background somewhere, uh, can uh, put those in the chat box so people can uh, have a look. Thank you, Mark. Um, Cheryl's asked, should we have a mental health first aider or is there a better way to get the necessary mental health awareness skills into our workforce? Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, I'm, um, I'm not a big fan of mental health first aid. We don't offer it. Um, and I don't, I don't personally and, and other companies may be different, but, um, my, my reasons for that is that often the mental, a mental health first aider is a a very important role in an organization. If you're going to give them responsibility for supporting your team members, if they come to them with a mental health challenge, uh, and the issue you've got with that is that there may be people in your team who wouldn't want to speak to that person. You're, you're essentially giving them, um, uh, the, the credit for people to, to come and speak to them. Whereas what we recommend um, is that, or, or what we offer is we'll do uh, an awareness session for your whole team. And then, and then people can speak to each other and you can raise awareness across the team. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the recommendation that we have. We've got a mental health awareness online course, um, which is relatively cheap as well. It's £35 per person. Um, or we can do Zoom sessions. So, And you could get a group of people on Zoom and we can go through uh, how they can support each other. So I do recommend embracing mental health in your team and as part of your culture. Um, Mental health first aids are really, really quite, it can be quite an expensive solution. Um, and, and there are other ways. So is that a fair answer? Uh, definitely. Yeah. And it's, it's not something that I've thought about previously. So if you appoint somebody as the mental health czar, for want of a better phrase, yeah. and somebody doesn't get on with that person, then that could potentially it, affect that person's mental health even more than if you didn't have one in the first place, which I hadn't, um, hadn't thought about. So uh, absolutely. Um, and who, who supports that person as well? When, yeah. they, when, when you put them in that position to, to support other people, who then supports them? So, and, and that's kind of why it, we believe it's much better to take a sort of holistic approach, have a, have a few people who have got a level of mental health awareness. And the other challenge with mental health first aid is it's, a, it's quite an in-depth two-day course and there's no real sticky plaster for mental health. It's not like, you know, we train first aid as well. And, and that's a process of keeping someone alive when there's a physical issue. Um, there's been an accident and, and that's what's happening. But what, what my belief is that actually mental health is something we should manage proactively so we don't get to that sort of accident or, or situation where first aid's needed. It's, it's about understanding and then signposting people to the relevant professionals um you know because it's so important to just actually go do you know what it's probably best we speak to your gp and and, and sort of progress things that way okay thank you um how do you think i should be advising my hair and beauty clients on health and safety yeah so um that was a really great question that came up uh came up before and I, i would say that um it really depends on their situation and it's probably best to get a health and safety company to to support them with that currently there's quite a few risks involved with that health and beauty client and it will depend on whether they're 
a sole trader on their own going into people's homes or whether they've got a salon, how many staff they've got um, and, and what, what sort of uh, services they're offering as part of that. So, uh, yeah, it really sort of depends. So uh, I would say get someone involved to support Get them to speak to you. <laughs> yeah, we're so happy to do that. But I, I, was conscious I'd already, actually... I was yeah. conscious I'd already talked about the online courses, so I didn't yeah, want to so promote this too much. <laughs> take, take advice. And if you want to take any good advice, then speak to Pete. And uh, contact details are in the chat box. Uh, so you can connect with Pete on LinkedIn. And if you tell him that you've uh, you've connected with him because of me, then... Uh, I'm sure he'll, he'll look after you even better than what he normally would. Yeah, uh, next sure. question then, Pete. Uh, can we ask team members to come in to meet clients face-to-face -face in a COVID-secure meeting room? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things that the government have asked us to do is carry out a COVID risk assessment. So that will be about your workplace. We're now talking about back in your workplace. And um, you understand um, sort of what the risks are. Um, in in your workplace and how you can mitigate those through ppe and hand washing and uh, uh cleaning process etc so um i'd recommend if you're going to have people in your workplace now you need to have a look at having a covid risk assessment again we've got a template and we can help you with that um however what we would suggest is that if you're asking people to come into the workplace to have face-to-face -face meetings i would ask why um, firstly, does it have to be face-to-face? -face? Can you reduce risk by having it via Zoom? I do understand that face-to-face -face with clients particularly helps build rapport, um, which is great. But I would also then really clearly communicate with your team member. If, if it's one of the team members that really doesn't want to come in, um, is there another way? Um, you know, is sort of what I would ask uh, the question. But if there's no other way and the, the member of staff is more than happy to do so, then I don't see an issue. It's really, and the, and the more more you talk about it, the more I'm coming to the conclusion, probably more so than what I was uh, before the conversation, is how much of the guidance is left open to interpretation. And we've had a conversation this morning about uh, the QR codes that should be put in places that are open to the public is that I believe is the definition on the website. And we've had a conversation this morning as to whether the our office is open to the public because we have customers come in but they can only come in by appointment so therefore that's not open to the public so we don't need to have the qr code but we we can argue that that conversation all and, and we've put the qr code up in the in the door in order to make sure that we're covered but the more more this conversation develops the more i understand that it's about our uh, personal risk our personal attitude to risk and our own personal interpretation of what is and isn't safe or, i suppose yeah ab ab absolutely absolutely the case it's very uh, certainly this time around it's much more gray than it has been in march um, however the expectation on us as employers now is to have a bit more in place around it uh you know in march it was much more open to off you go everyone's got to go home and if you haven't got anything in place then so be it we've got to we're in a pandemic whereas now we need to have the risk assessments in place however how we run as a business is uh, is being left more up to us as to how we manage it that that's well put simon Okay, thank you. And what about if a team member has asked to work from home, as opposed to us saying they've got to work from home? Is there a difference in process or attitude or the things that we have to do if it's their choice rather than our choice as the employer? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the government guidance has been if people can work from home, then they should. So can the person work from home? And if they can, then they should be working from home. Um, if they can't work from home and you need them in the business, but you, they are unwilling to come to the business, that then becomes an HR situation, mm. which, which would need dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then is there a minimum threshold of people where some of this really doesn't matter? Yeah, so... My argument as someone who's passionate about keeping people safe at work is that it all matters regardless of the size of the business. Um, however, uh, as I alluded to before, um, there's sort of this power of five. So we need to have a documented process in place for five plus uh, team, uh, team size. Uh, and for under that, uh, I would say it's best to follow the best practice. However, um, you, you don't need to have the same level of documentation. 
Thank you. Uh, and I, I know we've covered this, but just so we've got absolute clarity over it, do I need to assess the staff's chair slash desk at home? Yeah. So uh, no, you don't need to go to. You don't need to visit your team members' home. Um, the recommendation would be for them to uh, appropriately carry out their own assessment at home. And this is another great question that I hadn't thought about previously, but uh, with the best will in the world, we can tell the team what to do, but we can't police it. So where does the book stop? So say, for example, um, I've given the team a five-spoke chair, they've got a separate monitor and keyboard and all the rest of it, and then they choose to lay in bed on a laptop all day and get repetitive strain injury on the wrist. Who, whose responsibility is that? Yeah, 100%. So you've done your, you've done your risk assessment, you've provided the equipment, you've completely covered yourself as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, it's, it's a shared responsibility. So uh, if you've carried out your responsibility, then, you know, that's up to your team member and absolutely right. You can't please, you can't please it from home. Um, so really my guidance and recommendation is to uh, do the best with what you've got to provide people what you can. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's then back in their court. So it becomes their responsibility. So as long as we've made our best effort and appraised and done the risk assessment and provided everything that we feel that we need to, if they then choose not to use it, that's their lookout, not our lookout. Yeah, absolutely. And you you can't install CCTV to keep an eye on them. Okay. (laughs) Can your staff still work in the office if they want to? And if so, is there a minimum number of people? Yeah, so that's another great question. And they can... They can work in the office if they choose to, and it's COVID secure, um, and you've got the right risk assessment in place. And what I would suggest is a minimum of two. Um, we, you can have more than you can have one person in a workplace, but um, you, we're then getting into lone worker in a workplace, which you're responsible for. Um, so wherever possible, I'd suggest having two people on site at a time um, because that, that really reduces your risk of, um, of anything happening there. So, yeah, recommendation of two. And, and if, you, if you can't have two because there's only one other person, for example, so there's you and one team member mm-hmm. uh, and you've gone out to see a customer or you've gone to pick the kids up from school or whatever it is and you've left that team member in the office on their own, what, what sort of things do you need to be concerned about um, with a lone worker? Obviously, if they fall over and bank their head, they, they can't call her help or whatever so how, how does that work yeah so as as the business owner or, or you know as a business owner you're you're responsible for your member of staff whilst you've got a responsibility for their well-being whilst they're on site so if you're going to leave that person on their own um you know in in reality um in the business that we're in in you know we're talking about accountancy firms here the risk is really quite low um you know the, the risk of that happening is really quite low so um it's uh, it's a case of ensuring that you've got a check-in process. I would I would say would be the sort of first port of call. How long are you leaving for? Um, and and is there a check-in process? Has the person got access to a phone? Are they you know are they able to call for help if they need help? Um, and we'd start to look at those things with them. Brilliant. So one of the really easy ways around that, or to start get to get around that, is a, a check-in when they arrive and an anticipated leave time, and, and the check-out at five o'clock or whenever it is that they're supposed to go, so you know that they're still alive when they leave the office, basically. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. but physically alive, if not mentally alive, if uh, if I could be so uh, so rude. So I've answered, or you've answered, all the questions that we have had uh, pre-asked and in the chat box. If anybody else has got anything that they would like to ask Pete specifically, doesn't have to be about working from home it can be health and safety related uh, in any way shape or form if you want to pop those in the Q&A boxes uh, please do uh, just whilst I give people an opportunity to do that Pete can you just put your contact details up so uh, everybody can see where they can find you and obviously as I said earlier Mark has already put your uh, details in the chat box so I think I see Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, Brilliant. thanks, Simon. So, um, yeah, the, the offer that I sort of mentioned earlier for, for the group here is um, uh, a free DSE assessment template um, with, with the online course. Uh, other possible online courses that might be of interest for you guys to consider, no hard sell from it at all, um, but Introduction to Personal Safety for Lone Workers, which is kind of what we were talking about just now, Simon. Um, introduction to Risk Assessment. So that might be useful if you're looking to do your own risk assessments for COVID um, and, and for guiding your team members on doing their 
uh, uh, risk assessments too. Infection control may be worth looking at for how you're going to create a COVID secure workplace may be worth considering. And then also that mental health awareness course. Um, again, these are all ready to go online at any time, 24 um, seven, or if you're interested in doing something that's really geared towards your team and, and particular outcomes that you might have around mental health, we can look at doing a Zoom session for that as well. Um, flagship as a whole, we, we look after HR and health and safety. We've got a suite of training. I've talked about sort of first aid and mental health that we do. Um, and uh, from a compliance point of view, I'm a, I, I sort of uh, specialise in transport particularly, um, but uh, we're able to help with uh, various things. So, And then from a contact point of view, there's a QR code that's got my email address on there. So uh, if you're interested in sort of discussing further with me or a phone call um, just take a snap of that qr code uh, i learned how to do that yesterday on a powerpoint demonstration which i was really pleased to be able to put it in <laughs> so uh, yeah i'm not normally very technical with uh, things like powerpoint so uh, but yeah that's uh, that's it from me uh, simon thank you brilliant thank you so just for anybody that's never used a qr code on the screen like that if you take the camera on your mobile phone uh, don't take a picture, but if you just point it at the QR code, then it will automatically take you to an email or your email program. Uh, so you can email uh, Pete and, of course, ask him any questions. So uh, just check the I've got lots of thank yous coming through from Gillian and Steve and various other different pieces. Of I've got no further questions. So um all I'll do is just I'll say thank you very much for coming along, Pete. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for uh, sharing. I'm uh, I've definitely got more answers than what I had at the beginning of the conversation, and I almost feel no, I do feel more confident about what I need to be doing uh, in order to make sure that the team are safe uh, now they're working at home. So uh, thank you very much for that, Pete. Yeah, thank uh, you. Just have a quick check there's no others over there so that just leaves me to say uh, thank you to everybody for coming along and uh, obviously thank you to pete uh, for sharing the information and please do get in touch with pete on the linkedin profile or the website or send him an email and i'm sure pete will be able to help you out and make sure that your team are very safe thank you very much pete and we'll do the obligatory uh, Zoom wave goodbye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Bye. <laughs> Bye -bye, Pete. Thank you. Thank you for watching my interview with Pete Rushmere about how you can get your team to work safely from home. I hope you got as much value out of the conversation as what I did. Now, very shortly at the bottom of this screen, you will see the next two videos that I believe that you should watch in order to get even more value from the channel. So all you need to do is just click on the box to the right or to the left when it appears and away you go. Can I also ask you to like the video, please? If you have any questions or comments for Pete or myself, please feel free to put them underneath this video. And finally, please subscribe to the channel so you get notifications of when we publish videos for you to help inspire, challenge, and support you to run a better practice.